So during this talk, we are going to look at creating apps called Actions for the Google Assistant. We'll talk about the publishing process. We'll talk about the development and running costs. We'll look at testing and troubleshooting. And then we'll really look at the Google Assistant versus Alexa. So before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Keisha Williams. I'm sure in your head you were calling me Kesha, but <laughs> it's Keisha. I actually work in the IT department of Chick-fil-A. Say, what? Chick-fil-A has an IT department? Yes, we have an IT department. I've actually been there for 12 years. There are two parts to my role. So there's the boring part and the fun part. So the boring part, I am a full stack web developer. I work with Java and Spring on the back end and Angular on the front end. Now the fun part of my role, I actually get to lead innovation teams where we research using emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual reality, internet of things, computer vision and facial recognition, just researching and building prototypes, trying to figure out how these technologies can improve restaurant operations and customer experiences. So one team I recently led, we won the Think Different Innovation Award for using voice first technology. So that's why I'm here today to really talk to you through lessons learned. Now whenever I show this slide, eyes always zoom in on the NSA, the National Security Agency. So I actually started my career there. I have so many fun stories I could tell you, but if I did, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> so let's not talk about the NSA anymore. So whenever I prepare for a technical talk, I love having a case study because it always helps to show code to break down co concepts. So I've built several Amazon Alexa apps called Skills. And there's one that I created that actually won second place in a, cl a Cloud Gurus Speak Up STEM challenge. And so it's a skill that I'm very proud of, and so I wanted to recreate that for the Google Assistant. So it's called STEM Women, and let me show you a demo. Hey Google, let me talk to STEM Women. All right, here's the test version of STEM Women. Hello, my name is Stemma, the bot for STEM women. Let's begin. Tell me if you'd like to hear about an amazing woman in science, technology, engineering, or math. I'd like to hear about someone in technology. Edina Salinas is a software engineer. She has been coding since she was in high school. She finds being a programmer rewarding because she is able to design systems and see them come to life. So it's an action that's really there to show positive role models of women doing great things in STEM. So now let's dig in. What is an action? So like I said before, it's an app for the Google Assistant. It allows you to extend the functionality. And so actions let users get things done through a conversational interface. So when we talk about actions, what can we do? What are some of the cool actions on the market? So who knew that you could order pizza through your Google Assistant? You guys can order pizza. You can get recipes from the Food Network. How cool is that? You can get a price quote flying between Orlando and Atlanta through Kayak. You can actually order from Walmart. You can turn on your lights, turn off your lights using Harmony. You can even start your Mercedes Benz. Now that makes me want to go out and get a Benz. That's super cool. So there are a lot of cool things that you can do. So let's talk about the architecture of an action. So first we have a user. That user speaks to the Google Home device or another Google connected device. And that voice request is sent to the Google Assistant voice service. 
And then from there, it goes to a natural language processor. In this case, dialogue flow. Who's heard of dialogue flow? Okay. It used to be called API AI. Who's heard of API AI? Okay. And so once it goes through the natural language processor, it goes to a back end service running on Google Cloud. So that's the architecture. So there are two ways that you can create an action. So the first is using Dialog Flow, that API AI. And it's a really cool tool. So it's a web IDE that sits on top of the Actions SDK, and it allows you to build your action. And it has a natural language processor built in. And that's the way we're going to look at today. Now you can also use the Actions SDK directly. So if you have your own natural language processor and you have the raw text you want to send through, you can use the SDK directly. I recommend using Dialogflow and you'll see why. It makes life so much easier. So that's what we'll look at today. Now, when you think about developing an action, there are some steps that you follow. So the first, you have this innovative idea. And then you design the persona or the personality, and we'll look at that, the personality of your action. And then you think about the conversation. What's the conversational flow? You build the front end via dialogue flow, and then you build the back end via Google Cloud. So let's look at that. So the first step is innovation. What is that cool idea? What can you build that will actually make someone's life easier. Now I can't help you come up with that cool idea, but I will show you how to bring that idea to life. So the next step is to design the persona. So for STEM women, the persona, her name is Stemma, and don't laugh at me. All of my AI programs I give a name. So we have Stemma. Stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Assistant. So Google recommends that you separate your app, your action, from the Google Assistant. And the way you do that is by defining this persona. So the next step, you build a conversation path. So what does that look like? So we have a user that says, OK, Google, let me talk to STEM women. And then we have the Google Assistant responding, sure, here are STEM women. And then now your persona comes to life. And so Stemma comes to life and she says, hello, my name is Stemma, let's begin. Tell me if you'd like to hear about an amazing woman in science, technology, engineering, or math. And that's the demo that we saw. And so the user responds, tell me about a woman in technology. And then Stemma responds with an answer. So once you've designed and thought through this conversation, it's time to start building. So the first step is to build the front end. So there are two accounts that you'll need to create. First, a Dialogflow account, and then an account on the Google Cloud platform. And whenever you create your accounts, make sure you use the email address that you control your Google Home device with, and that will make it easier when it's time to test. So first, I created an account on the Google Cloud platform. They have a 12-month free tier offering and then also a $300 credit. So it's very cost effective. You can actually get in there and play around and not invest a lot of money up front. So once you create your account, you go to the Actions on Google console and you need to create a project. Very simple and straightforward. Now the project lets you define metadata and it also lets you track your app through the approval process. So once you click on creating a project, you just enter very simple project details, like the name, the country, region, et cetera, and you click Create Project. And then you'll see a screen that looks like this. So now it's time for you to create your action using Dialogflow. Now, once you click on that button, you will see several pop-ups regarding authorization. 
So I saw maybe three or four, just say yes. Just click yes to everything so that you can continue on. So here I had to authorize the Google account and put some other screenshots in there. I just said allow, yes, whatever, yes, accept. OK, so now let's get to the fun part. We are actually in dialogue flow. And remember I said that's the web IDE that allows you to build actions. So the first step is to create your agent. So what is the agent? It's the conversational interface for your application. So today our agent represents a conversation highlighting women in STEM. So you enter the name, that's number one, the description, additional information. Now the most important thing on this slide is number five. And this is where you're linked back to that Google app that we just created. So if you invoke Dialogflow from the Google Cloud platform, that's automatically populated for you. So what's the next step? Creating what's called intents. So this is the phrase that a user says to interact with your application. So in this case, tell me about a woman in math. Tell me about a woman in science. I'd like to hear about someone in technology. So you go through and you enter all of your intents. So you click the plus sign, enter the name, step two, and then you enter the phrases, step three. Very simple. Notice the yellow highlights. Remember that and I'll come back to why that's important. So this is just a, a look at some of the intents from the previous screen. Now my first lesson learned. You have to create entities first before you create your intents. Now the way the UI is laid out, first you have intents and then you have entities. So you would think, okay, do the intents first, then do the entities, but that's not how it works. You have to do the entities first. So what is an entity? So it's basically the value that you want to retrieve from the user. So developers kind of think of it like a parameter that you're passing to a method or a function. And so the entities for STEM women are science, technology, engineering, and math. So the very first time, I did not create my entities first, and so things didn't work as expected. So just do, remember to do the entities first. So that's the screen. So you click the plus sign, and then you enter the name, step two, and then you enter the list of values. And if you can see right next to math, one cool thing about dialogue flow, it allows you to enter synonyms. So for example, for math, someone may say mathematics instead of math. And so Dialogflow allows you to enter those synonyms when you create entities. Super cool. And so now, in those intents, if you notice the yellow highlights, it basically means the system recognizes those as values that can be passed in. And one other thing to note, there's a list of predefined entities. So before you go in and create a custom list, just look and see what's already out there first. So dates, states, counties, units of measure, they all have predefined lists that you can use. So the next step is to create your action. Now this is not the same action as the Google action. So dialogue flow previously was owned by another company before Google bought it. And so there's some conflicting terms. So when I say action here in Dialogflow, it actually represents the step that your application takes when a specific intent has been triggered. Okay? So in this case, the action retrieves the parameter or that field. And so if you notice in step two, it's retrieving the field. And then notice I'm able to set that as a required parameter, which is really cool. And so, because it's required, I can manually enter a prompt. So if the user says something and the field is not present, we can prompt them. So which field would you prefer to hear about? Science, technology, engineering, or math? Very simple. Really cool. Who's heard about small talk? 
I really love this feature, and this is one advantage that Google has over Amazon. And so whenever I'm bored and I'm playing around with my Google Home device, I will just ask random questions like, how old are you? Where are you from? What's your name? <laughs> and so Dialogflow has a list of questions that you can put a, a canned response in. And so that makes it really easy. So for example, if someone says, who are you? The canned response that I have, I am Stemma, a bot that lives in your Google Home device and in all other Google connected devices. So there are about three pages of can question, standard questions that you can put a canned response for. Very simple. So when it comes to creating a skill, the front end, that's it. That's it. And so at this point, what I like to do after I've created the front end, I like to test it via the simulator. And so really, I'll just put in a hard-coded canned response just so that I could make sure the parameters are being passed in correctly before I integrate the back end. And so I recommend that you guys do that. And then also modify the default welcome intent. So whenever a user triggers your action, you can have a custom welcome message. Also for quit. So whenever a user quits, you can add a custom message. So for example, with STEM women, whenever a user ends that action, it says something like, we'll come back tomorrow because we add new women on a daily basis. And then also add a help intent. That's always very useful. And then the small talk. OK, so that's the front end. So now let's talk about the back end. So the back end, this is really the service or the API. It's the logic for your skill. Sorry, you can tell I'm, I've done a lot of Amazon development. It's the logic for your action. And so it's the service or the back end API. And it's really responsible for returning the response to the user. So for STEM women, the back end is in Node.js. It runs as a Google Cloud function, um, and it's stored in a Google Cloud storage bucket. So if you remember that architecture diagram from the beginning, now we're looking at this last piece here, Google Cloud. So the end goal is to set up a fulfillment via a webhook in Dialogflow. So that basically links the front end to your backend API. And so we want to have the URL to our API to plug in here. And so that means we actually have to do some development work. So this is just a sample of the Node.js code. At the very bottom, I have the link to GitHub for the full um, package. So the code is very simple, nothing complex, nothing fancy, because I just wanted to prove out the technology. And so in the code, I have four hard-coded arrays, one for science, one for technology, one for engineering, and one for math. And whenever a request comes in, I basically pull a random value from the array. And that is what's returned to the user. Very simple. So the coding part was easy. Setting up my development environment, not so easy. And so in order to write and deploy a Google Cloud function, first you have to set up your local environment. You have to create your cloud platform project, enable billing, enable Cloud Functions API, install the cloud SDK and G Cloud, and deploy your function. So instead of taking you guys through those steps, you can follow the tutorial that I have at the very bottom. It's a very good tutorial. But what I want to share with you today, lessons learned. So all of the issues that I ran into trying to do these simple steps, I'm going to share with you. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, a Google Cloud function is basically like what it sounds like. So it's a chunk of code that's running in the cloud. And the Google Cloud SDK is a set of tools that you can use to control your Google Cloud platform environment. 
And then G Cloud, it's the command line interface. Okay? So, my first lesson learned. So, there's a step in that tutorial where you install the Cloud SDK and G Cloud. So, the command I have there, G Cloud components update ampersand ampersand. So, when I ran this command, straight like how they have it in the tutorial, I received this error. So, you cannot perform this action because you do not have permissions. Who's seen that error before? And so, I had to rerun it, the solution on the very bottom, using sudo. So, I'm on a Mac, so basically I had to run the command as super user. So, that was the first issue I ran into. So, the next issue, also installing the cloud SDK in G Cloud. I ran that command, installing the components. And when I ran the command, just like how they have it in the tutorial, I saw this message. It said all components were up to date. So that was confusing because I'm just installing the components. How can it be up to date? Well, that issue self-corrected. So when I got ready to deploy my cloud, my, my function to the cloud, then it prompted me to do the download. My next lesson learned. So I have a lot of lessons. <laughs> my next lesson learned. So this was when I was deploying the function. So that's the command that you use to deploy your function to the cloud. And I learned so many lessons. So the first lesson, whenever you run this command, it's looking for a file called index.js or function.js. So make sure you name your file either one of those names. And then we have, you see in the green, we're running the G Cloud command, beta functions deploy. Now look at stemma HTTP. That's the name of the function in the file, in my source code. So make sure you, you know that and you use the name of the, the function. And then next, the stage bucket. So this is where you're actually deploying your code. So when I set up my account, two buckets were created. One was the stage bucket and one was the production bucket. So you actually have to go back to your Google Cloud account to find the bucket name to put in this command. And then on the very end, notice trigger HTTP. That's very important. So that is actually going to create the HTTP endpoint that you need to plug into that webhook that we looked at earlier. And then local path. So that basically points to where your source code file is. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So once the command finally worked, you'll notice if you can see it, you get the URL. So that's the URL to your cloud function that you plug into the webhook. So what was my next lesson learned? And so this again when I was deploying the function. Now this one I spent more time than I'd like to admit trying to figure out what in the world was going on. And so I saw this error, invalid bucket. And I kept saying the bucket name is right. I copied it directly from the Google Cloud account. And so I Googled and I Googled. I couldn't find this error. I'm like, I know I can't be the only person to have seen this error before. And so finally, well, I was copying and pasting pieces and parts of the command. So finally, I just said, forget it. I'm typing this by hand. And when I typed it, magic. It worked. And so there was either a special character or a hidden something going on with copying and pasting that threw everything off and really wasted a lot of my day. So stay away from copy and paste. I don't know what the issue was. I have no idea. OK, so this one was fun. So whenever you run this command to deploy, it's creating a zip file of the entire directory that your source code is stored in. Now, I didn't know that, so I had my index.js just in my main directory. And so it was trying to zip up everything and deploy it. And so I saw this error, and it was really simple to fix. I just put the index.js in its own directory. And then I used that local path flag to point to that directory. And it worked.
Okay. So yet again, another error. So again, on deploying the function. I deployed the function and I saw failure in the execution environment. And so I just ran the command again. And it worked. So I'm assuming the very first time, maybe because it takes a while to just set up and provision the underlying infrastructure, maybe there was a timeout. I don't know. But I ran it again, and it worked. So if you ever see this error, just run your command again. So once I was able to deploy, I got the URL, that's step three, and I enabled the webhook. And then there's also a step at the very bottom here. You have to check use webhook to enable your fulfillment. And then you guys can see I really believe in testing. <laughs> so I tested again via the dialog flow console. So at the very top at the left hand, you can enter the intent phrase, tell me about a woman in science. You can see the response that you get back and then also the JSON. So now we've finished setting up the front end and the back end. Now it's really time to test on a real device. So how do you do that? You integrate with actions on Google. So your first step is you set up your integration. Then you enable your configuration information. You test again via the web simulator. And then you test on a real device. So let's look at that. So now we're looking at step two. So we need to update the app with actions. And you do that in Dialogflow through the integrations. Now one cool thing about Dialogflow, you can integrate with Facebook Messenger, Twitter, there's a long list. But today, of course, we're looking at Google Assistant. So you click on Integrations, and then you click on Google Assistant. And then you set up your integration. You authorize. Well, you enter some additional information like the welcome intent. And then you authorize, and then you test. So Actions on Google also has a simulator. And that's what this um, screenshot is. So here you can enter the phrase and see the response. And now you're ready for testing. And remember I said earlier that make sure when you create your accounts, you use the same email address that you use to control your Google Home device. And so that made it really easy when it was time for me to test. Now, of course, I did run into issues. So what lesson did I learn? So initially, I was trying to test it by using the name, OK Google Open STEM Women. And for some reason, I don't know why, it didn't work. And so I Googled, and I Googled, and I Googled, and I Googled, and then I found that I needed to say this. Hey, Google, talk to my test app. Don't know why. And eventually, I could start saying, open STEM women. But the very first time, this is what I had to do. So in case you run into that issue, that's how I solved it. Now publishing. So you've tested, you think you're finished, and you submit your action for certification and publishing. And so you can do that through the actions on Google Console. You enter just high-level app information. And then if you see at the very bottom right hand, the blue button says Submit Draft for Review. Now I can tell you this publishing process was a whole lot easier than the Amazon skill publishing process. It never fails. Whenever I submit a skill to Amazon, it fails at least three or four times. This one only failed once. And so the issue, I was leaving the mic open. So essentially, after the user sent the question in and got a response, the Google was still sitting there listening. And so that's a no-no. And so there's an option, number one, where you click and you say, end conversation. So that's all I had to do. I checked that, and I submitted my action again, and it was approved. 
Yay. Only one failure. Now, so I went through that whole process to recreate my Amazon Alexa skill. But did you know that you can import Alexa skills into Dialogflow? Well, I'm still glad that I went through the learning process because I have a lot of good tidbits to share with you guys. But just so you know that you, there's a way to import Alexa skills into Dialogflow. So definitely check that out. So let's look at the cost. So for running cloud functions, the first 2 million calls are free. Anything beyond that, 40 cents. And then remember, I told, I told you about the $300 credit. So now let's have some fun. Google Assistant versus Alexa. And I hope Amazon does not come after me. <laughs> So I, have, I, I had a lot of fun playing with the two. And so let's look at this quick video. Alexa, can I machine wash silk? Sorry, I don't know that one. Hey, Google, can I machine wash silk? On the website, tie.com, they say, Fill a clean sink or small tub with cold water and a small amount of liquid detergent, light tide free and gentle liquid. Lightly agitate for three to five minutes and rinse well. If the care label advises machine washing, choose a gentle cold water cycle. So now you guys know how to machine wash silk. <laughs> and so about 85 to 90% of the time, they both were able to answer the same question. But there were times when the Google Assistant could answer questions that Alexa couldn't. And that is a result of just Google really having search and the world at its fingertips. So I've really seen Google shine in that area, which makes sense. <laughs> so one thing that's different between the two, Google Assistant is different across devices, where Alexa is not. Now, I was very surprised to learn that. So something you can do with your Google Home, you might not be able to do with the assistant on your Android device. So that's one difference to note. Now, the Google Assistant needs an additional layer to handle the natural language processing. And that's what we looked at with Dialogflow. Now I think this is super cool. I haven't played around with it yet, but I will. But Google Assistant can distinguish like my voice from my husband's voice or my son's voice. So that I like to play around with. Now Alexa can't do that yet. Now this feature is really, really cool. So Google Assistant has a built-in machine learning that allows the system to learn and grow. So essentially, within Dialogflow, there's a training option. And so every spoken request that, goes, that comes to the device is stored in this training. And if the assistant is not able to answer a question, you can go in and point that question to one of the intents. So that is really cool. Now, I really like this feature. So Google Assistant users don't need to pre-enable actions. So with Amazon Alexa, you have to enable that skill. With Google Assistant, once your, once your action is published, all users just automatically get it. So that's really cool. So Dialogflow has a tool specific to creating intents. And we just saw that whereas Amazon requires you to load a raw intent schema. Now, Amazon does have this new beta skill builder. I haven't had a chance to play around with it, but I bet it will look a lot like Dialogflow. That's my theory. And then it just looks so much cooler. When I saw this picture, I was like, wow, I want that one. <laughs> 
So what's next for you? I've, sh I've explained to you the process for creating an action. It's very simple, very straightforward. So just enter a hackathon or a challenge and see what you can do. And then also, once you publish your first action, you get this really cool t-shirt that you can sport. And there is a big community, Actions on Google, um, com developer community on Google+, that if you get stuck, if you have questions, you can reach out to the community. So that's what's next for you. What's next for STEMA, STEMA 2.0? And so one, I want to get rid of those hard-coded arrays and store the women in a database. So if anyone is curious and wants to learn more about developing actions, we can work on that together. Just let me know. I want to include photos of the women. And then also, I want to add a web self-service form. So anyone, any woman can just go in and add herself to the database. So if you'd like to be included, let me know. OK, thank you.